Uh, thanks for attending. So today I want to talk to you about building a chatbot in AWS, specifically AWS Lex, but not just building a chatbot, but how to go about defining what your chatbot needs to do initially. Um, I work in the uh, public sector, obviously, with uh, universities mostly in uh, Victoria. And we've gone through about three unis at the moment have started building chatbots. And primarily what we've found is they're building chatbots to help with um, support desk staff. So to get rid of all of those low-hanging fruit questions for support desk staff, and we'll get to some of those use cases. I just thought I'd quickly go through what exactly is a chatbot. So uh, Wikipedia defines it as a program that conducts a conversation via auditory or textual methods. Such programs are often designed to convincingly simulate how a human would behave as a conversational partner. Although as of this year, they are far short of being able to pass the Turing test. And uh, what is the Turing test? Well, the Turing test is a method of inquiry in artificial intelligence for determining whether or not a computer is capable of thinking like a human being. And this was developed by Alan Turing. You may or may not have heard of him in the 1950. And uh, he actually cracked the Anansi uh, Enigma code. Um, this movie about him with Benedict Cumberbatch. So let's quickly talk about Amazon Lex. So Amazon Lex is the service that you would use to build a conversational interface. It integrates tightly with all of our other AWS services. And a couple of things that set it apart from some of the other chatbot development um, services out there, you can integrate Lambda two stages. Uh, so I'm assuming this is a 300 session, so I'm assuming you have some uh, knowledge around AWS, Lambdas, and all of that, but uh, a Lambda is just allows you to write a little bit of serverless code. You can execute it choosing whatever language you like. Um, but what's unique about Lex is it allows you to do it at two stages during the fulfillment of, of, of an intent, and we'll get to what an intent is shortly. Um, it provides authentication to the other AWS services by IAM, so you can tightly lock down what your chatbot is actually allowed to access within your environment. And then you could also provide user authentication utilizing Cognito. <clears throat> it's got built-in channel support for Kik, Slack, Twilio, and Facebook. Um, and then the other one that really sets it apart is Amazon Connect. For those of you who may not have heard of Amazon Connect, it's our um, software as a service contact center solution. Um, so you can go to your console today and spin up the entire uh, contact center utilizing Amazon Connect. And then you can actually backend Lex to telephony. So if people phone up, their first port of call would be with Lex, and they would have a conversation with Lex. And if Lex cannot answer their question, you can then queue them and put them onto a, 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 you know, a real life human operator via telephony. So that's a really awesome product. You don't have to use it with Lex. You can use it if you just need a, a contact center solution. It's a really awesome product if you haven't seen that yet. Um, <clears throat> basic structure of a chatbot. So it doesn't really matter what technology you're going to use to build a chatbot. They all very much follow the same structure. You've got intent. And the intent is what is the user's intention? What do they want to do by asking this question that they're asking? And typically, a chatbot would have many intents, of course. Um, so you would define an intent, the particular goal that the user is trying to achieve. You would train your bot with utterances. So a bot needs to learn, at the very least, if a person says what, how do I then map that to that intent? So typically, you would train a bot with maybe five to 10 utterances that map to one intent, different ways that a question can be asked. And in this instance, it's spoken a type phrase that invoke your intent. So the utterance that the user might say is, I'd like to book a hotel. The bot will pick that up. It's been trained to understand that. It will map it then to the book hotel intent. But as well as being able to just map it to intent, there are certain variables in a question that we need to handle as well. And we, we, we define these as slots. So for those of you who are developers, if you're writing a function that accepts parameters, think of a slot as a parameter. Um, so we have to define slots, which are variable values, even within a static utterance. 
and it might be a slot as in city. So you'd like to book a hotel, that's fine, we've picked it up, but in which city would you like to book the hotel? So you don't want to have an utterance for every single city um, mapped out that's available. I want to book a hotel in Denver, I want to book a hotel in New York, I want to book a hotel in Melbourne, and have those as multiple utterances that you're training it. You would just define a slot with all of those values, and we've actually got built-in slots for all your city types, so you don't have to worry about training it for cities, and you would use that slot within an utterance. Um, you can also have the bot come back and prompt a user if they haven't filled in uh, additional information. So in this instance, we actually require two slots. We require a city name and we require a date. Um, so the bot has come back and said which city, we've entered in the city, um, then it says, well, which date would you like to check in? Now, if the user was a power user, if you will, or they knew exactly what they wanted, they could have said, I'd like to book a hotel in New York City. <clears throat> what date do they use here? Uh, for November the 30th. If the user had typed all of that in, your bot would have understood all of that. It would have mapped that utterance to that intent, and it would have auto-filled those slot values with New York City and November the 30th. If the user kind of wants to be guided through the conversation, they can just say, I'd like to book a hotel. The bot will automatically prompt which city. Um, then it would also ask them what date they'd like to check in, November 30. <coughs> and what you can also achieve with Lex is just a final confirmation prompt, as this could be a transactional uh, component that would fire off in the back end to actually reserve that hotel room for that date. Um, are you sure you want to book? Yes. And then you would send all of that off to your Lambda code. Your Lambda code would execute, integrate into a hotel reservation system and actually make the booking and optionally, most likely, send a, a text message or an email back to the user. But the user has done the entire booking just through the bot. But what's important to note is we have an intent, book hotel intent, cancel room intent, book car intent, so all of your sort of actions or assistance um, things, oh, what's a better word for things? But anything that provides assistance or anything with, that a user would like to action typically would create an intent. Utterances, many utterances to train the bot to understand what type of uh, question to expect from the user coming in to then map it to that intent. It does not have to be an exhaustive list. That is what's so good about natural language processing. Um, because Lex is collecting information and all of these utterances from around the globe, it's continuously learning. So if you even, if a user had to type in, um, let me book a hotel, for example, and we haven't trained it with that utterance, chances are Lex will still be able to map that phrase to that intent as part of its natural language processing. So I've done a little bit of a demo, just a very, very simple one. Um, <clears throat> and this is typical, I'm going to lean a lot on the universities as an example. Um, and in this one, I've just built a very simple bot with a single intent called find. And, um, and it just allows the user to find something. You know, that in this instance, I've created a slot value of what would you like to find, and it's got two values that it accepts, an ATM or parking. Um, so if I'm not going to type in everything, I'm too lazy, I'm just going to send that to the bot. Where is an ATM? The bot goes off, it actually executes the lambda, it puts the value ATM into the slot, matches it to the intent of find intent, which you'll see over there, matches the slot to ATM, and then with those two values, I send it off to my Lambda function, and now I know exactly what I need to go and look for. So, you know, where is an ATM? Yeah. So I've given just a little bit of a Furby answer over there. Um, and then I've also trained it with a synonym. So a slot can take values, but you can also provide synonyms for those values. So I might talk of an ATM, someone else might, might talk of a, uh, of a cash machine, or where can I withdraw cash. 
So I get to the same answer. One intent, one slot, just a couple of synonyms. But as you can see, fairly different ways of phrasing the question, but it still goes through to the same answer. Uh, what's also nice about slots, you can actually provide the user with a guided uh, interface. If I had to type in where can I, I find toilet, I haven't taught it what a toilet is, and it'll actually come back and say, well, what exactly are you looking for? You're looking for parking or you're looking for an ATM. So, and that, is, that has all been handled by Lex. The only time that it's gone outside of Lex to, to my Lambda code is just to go and find that answer. So <clears throat> to set up the chatbot in Lex, yeah, of course, I've been doing it a little bit, but there's some really simple, simple code. Uh, it took me m maybe about an hour just to get everything up and running. This Lex chatbot UI sample parent page is actually something you can download from our GitHub if you want to get started with a, with a web interface. Um, so you can just go and you know, go Google for Lex web UI, and it'll actually give you all of this. Unfortunately, you can only run it in US East 1. Um, Lex is not available yet in Sydney region, but it is very imminent. So if not Q3, uh, very early Q4. <clears throat> but specifically what I wanted to talk about, the technology is one thing, and, and later on we'll get to what that architecture looks like, how it hangs together, and I'll show you some of the code and, and how to define the intents and the slots and all of that. But um, the biggest challenge that we face with customers, or their biggest challenge that we have with customers, let me put it that way, is deciding we want to do a chatbot, but we're not quite sure what we want to do. Some people want to do it because it's, it's a buzzword, it's a funky thing, other people are doing it. Um, but then there are a lot of real use cases, especially with the universities, where their full-time staff that are manning their support centers and fielding calls from students um, are completely inundated. Um, students are waiting really long, in, long um, on, the, on the phone queues or even on the web queues where they've got full-time staff sitting behind web chats. Um, so typically, a really good place to start would be a support desk. And you can even do it for an internal support desk. If you're a large organization and people are constantly bothering maybe the IT ops team, how do I change my password? How do I do this? Um, you've got some really low-hanging fruit questions that a bot can easily answer for you. And this is for an anonymous user. So this is just someone that logs onto a website or dials up a, 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 a number and just asks the question without identifying or authenticating themselves. So you know, how do I reset my password for the system? It's just gonna give you a generic answer, something that they can find maybe under an FAQ on your public website, those sorts of questions. <coughs> Um, you know, and in there in blue, I've, I've put system as a slot because you could handle a call of how do I reset my password for my Windows machine, for my MacBook, how do I reset it for my uh, email account. And you can kind of handle three different questions with one intent but with three different slot values. And then not everything requires a slot value. What are the term dates? Very simple question, there's, there's no, no slot required there. And then in the little example that I've done is where can I find something? And that's, an, uh, th that's actually a question that's often asked by students. If we have authenticated users, support desk, internal or external, um, <clears throat> maybe a student wants to book an appointment with a lecturer or with a mentor for a certain date and time. So we need to know who that person is. Yeah, we don't just want any arbitrary anonymous person just booking appointments. So you would authenticate them as they get to the website. They're already authenticated. You can use that token and pass it along with Lex. Lex will then know who this person is. They can book that appointment. They can look for availability. And if everything is good, they can actually go and update that person's calendar as well as the person that they've booked the appointment with that their calendar as well. Um, how many days personal leave, annual leave, sick leave, um, bereavement leave, all different types of leave do I have? Um, and then even we have, we, we have that um, with some of our customers actually playing with this is um, to spin up a new development environment for that solution. 
and that will then actually go off and execute Lambda, which will call some cloud formation and then generate the environment, and it's all done. Um, so the, there are many ways that you can use a bot, and I know a lot of people collaborate via Slack, so you can make this bot uh, available via Slack for your internal teams, and people can start asking the bot questions. Um, some other things that you can do, uh, one example, when I, w I did a bit of work for a health insurer, and we often had meetings, and when we would talk with the business, the business were very keen to understand how many claims that they have, what was the value of the claims versus um, premiums for the past month, quarter, and all of that. You can even just have this part in the meeting, and people can just ask it this question is to facilitate the context of that meeting as well. So for our sample use case scenario, we've got an external support desk. The business problem, this, this, is, this is relatively real business problem that we faced. Customers were currently waiting up to an hour to have a simple question answered, so they'd go to a, a web chat window. At the back, I think this specific uh, customer only had three full-time staff manning this web, web, web chat. Um, <clears throat> and people were waiting up to an hour to ask a really simple question, as in what are the term dates? What is the address of this place? So, um, so the business estimated that by offloading these simple questions, they could save call wait times by up to 66%. They did achieve that and more, in fact. Um, and the channels they have in use were a telephone, Facebook Messenger. Um, so people were sitting behind, you know, the Facebook Messenger, and then people were sitting behind answering those questions. So the proposal that AWS and the IT team came up with to the business was to create a chatbot to answer those simple questions as defined by the business. Uh, we had them go through the existing call logs to define what those low-hanging, simple questions were, but that were in high abundance. Uh, we got them to introduce a new web, uh, interface web, and we also integrated with their Facebook channel. Uh, we left telephony integration for the future. You don't kind of want to tackle everything at once. Get a chatbot in, let it do some simple stuff, don't, don't try and boil the ocean with your first chatbot. Get it in within a few months. Uh, make it solid. Keep training it. Let the users know that it's continuously learning. And after it's proven itself, then you can start introducing different channels if you feel there's a need. So where do you start with something like that? So you've got your problem. You've got your proposal. <clears throat> and this is very important. And this is, um, we've seen some customers just kind of jump in feet first and just started doing stuff and it wasn't a success. You really need to define the goal of what you want your chatbot to do, your first phase. What is the goal? What do you want it to achieve? So in this one, we want to assist new students with basic tasks and finding their way around campus. Just very simple. We, we, we target a specific cohort, a specific user base with very specific um, questions that we knew that they would come through that we picked up from the call logs. Define intents from your top simple requests and aim for between five to ten intents. Remember, an intent isn't one question. Multiple questions could arrive at an intent by using slots. So you can have, um, I had the find intent. And find, if you think of all the different slot value permutations you can put in there, find toilet, find parking, find ATM, find library, find meeting rooms, find, um, I don't know what, cafes, find coffee shops. You know, all very generic stuff. Um, and that would just be one intent. That would allow you to maybe find up to 10 different things within the campus. Um, a lot of them that we eventually worked through were either action or assistance based and be very sure to make use of slots. Slots are very important. They give you massive scalability straight out, out the bat. You don't want to create utterances that sound very similar. So you don't want a find toilet intent and a find ATM intent with where can I find a toilet, where can I find an ATM. You can already see those sentences or those utterances are very similar. And um, later on, I'll talk about the confusion matrix, or I'll touch on it. It's, it's something, if you're interested, really worth a Google, and there's a good Wikipedia article on it, where a bot can also get confused if it's got way too many similar utterances that it's trying to map to different intents. So 
If you are going to embark on creating a bot and working through these intents, get a partner or get someone with who's already done it because they can really help guide you. Um, you know, where will you get your sample utterances for training? Um, call logs are a good place to start. Let people throw things around. You'll never think of every permutation. As your bot goes live and you get what we call missed intents, you'll see an utterance that should have actually hit an intent that you've defined, but the way the user has phrased it, it's just you didn't think about that. But that's okay. That just comes as part of your continuous, um, continuous improvement cycle. You will then take that utterance and provide a way, mechanism for your support staff to attach it to that intent, retrain your model, redeploy. Okay, very importantly, where can the answers be found? So when we embark on these, we happily assume that the users have got a beautiful knowledge base with all the answers and it's all there and we'll just hook in via an API or something, call through Lambda and get the answer back. That's not the case um, across different faculties. They've got different systems, even within the same faculty, same places, even in the IT ops. Answers are spread across different solutions and that really made it tricky, and that could take you a long time to start collating and getting an API. Well, if it's this intent, go to that API. If it's this intent, go there. So start small, and what most of the customers have opted to do is to refresh or re-curate uh, their answers, and in, in what we've done with them, we've put it into DynamoDB for a start, just as a single place to start. If you want to install a headless <coughs> Drupal content management system, you want to put your answers in there and go pull them out of there, that's fine. And this example that I'm going to show you here, we put it, everything into uh, DynamoDB. That's great. It's quick and it's easy. It's very generic so, um, uh, table schema that we set up that can handle any intent or combination of slot values. The only thing, of course, is you don't want to give your operational, well, ideally, the AWS console into DynamoDB it's not the most user-friendly for operational staff, you know, back-end uh, business people. So I highly recommend to, you know, build a little web interface into the, that DynamoDB information. Um, and that can be, you know, you can build something like that in Vue.js. I've personally done it. Not production grade, of course, but within a day or two. It's, it's really quick. Um, but very important to understand where can those answers be found you know, where is the ATM? Well, you know, ignore the, those, those things in the wall labeled ATM. Technical architecture, I will go through that shortly. It's end-to-end um, -end for fulfillment, completely serverless. There is a little managed services component, but that is more for analytics, where we utilize Elasticsearch and a Kibana dashboard. And very importantly, that I've found, and I've worked on quite a few projects in my life, this is very different from an operational support because it's continuous training and updating and management. It's not waiting for something to break, first level support, second, third, fix it. This is you're continuously monitoring. You want to see if people are hitting it. You want to see if people are missing intents with valid utterances. You want to keep updating it. If you've done five or ten intents in your phase one, you want to already start thinking about your next set of intents. A very important thing, uh, I tripped up one of our customers when you think about which questions you want the bot to answer, think about when you're going to go live with the bot. They were thinking about the questions that they were getting at that point in time, but when they went live with the bot in three months, the questions that, we, that were being asked in three months' time were very different to the ones that were being asked three months prior. So when you are looking at which intents to build, think about when you're most likely going to deploy and what the most pertinent questions would be at that point in time. Continuous training and updating, and set expectation to users up front. Let them know, say, hey, I'm blah, blah, but I'm still learning, and I know we see that everywhere, and it's, I don't know, it even annoys me a little bit when I see, it. well, I'm still learning, I'm still learning, but fair enough. All bots are like learning, they're, they're like little babies, and they learn, and they grow, and they mature, um, and as long as you keep adding to that, so you can get some stickiness from people and make sure you mark it out when you've provided new functionality. Let people know the bot is, is capable of answering more complex questions than some new questions. Test, train, test. So keep testing, training, testing. Ensure that it understands correctly. Um, 
I'll actually just play this little video. It's just um, someone not understanding exactly what the issue is. Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächter. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. So it's a German Coast Guard. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hello? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? So, yeah, so a bit of classical misunderstanding there. Um, but create an automated test regime. Uh, every time you train your bot or you've done some new stuff, make sure that you run it through this, these uh, questions that you've, not necessarily the utterances that you've trained it with, but think of utterances that sound similar. And you'll know exactly if I ask it this, I'm going to expect this answer and I'm going to expect this intent to be hit. And then also ask it questions where you don't want to define an answer. Like, where can I go for a you know, septoplasty, for example? Where can I find a septoplasty? Something like that, where you're expecting a negative and you want the bot to answer in the negative so you can test the negative path as well. And so that's a list of non trained utterances. And then learn about the confusion matrix. I, I was going to go into it in another slide, but it's just, it's confusing. And it takes time to kind of go through. But it's really worthwhile understanding the confusion matrix if you're going to be working with natural language processing and uh, training your bot and expecting answers. You want to have a good testing re uh, regime. Learn about the um, confusion matrix. Oh, so let's just get out of there. <coughs> Okay, so what could a solution look like? This solution, um, whenever I do a little POC for a customer, it's always based like this. I've actually, even what I've uh, used for this demo here, I can now reuse that Lambda code because it's so generic, as well as the, the, the schema for the DynamoDB, and I'll show you guys what that looks like. But in short, we've got the customer on the side, either via mobile or a desktop client. <clears throat> now, the one thing, that's different to if you just had to go build Lex through a tutorial or something that will guide you. Typically, you would go from there directly to the chatbot, to the API of the chatbot. We've introduced this concept of an interceptor. A couple of reasons. One of the main ones is, unfortunately, and, and, and it just seems to be with most of the chatbots there, the analytics that you get back from them, specifically to do with missed intents or utterances that missed an intent and that, are only in the Lex at the moment, are only provided to you once a day. So it's only available once a day, so you can't immediately react if you, like the beginning phases, you want to be training your bot not to be missing stuff so people have a good experience. Um, so what we've done in that instance, we've created a Lambda interceptor the Lambda will eventually call Lex through the Lex API, and it's a very simple API. It's post-text with a few parameters, or post-content if it's, if it's audio. Um, but at that point, we know exactly what the user has typed in. We know exactly what's going to Lex and what Lex gives us back. So we actually put that onto a Kinesis data firehose, and we just dump that straight into an elastic search that we've set up down here. That comes with a nice Kibana dashboard, and you can set up a word cloud of your most, uh, you know, your highest um, hit intents, um, missed utterances, all that sort of stuff that your support staff can continuously monitor. Um, and then again, there's the custom web app here. So they can monitor the Kibana dashboard straight away. They can log in using their federated um, identity that might be linked to your Azure AD or whatever IDM solution you have. Um, they can then be monitoring the Kibana dashboard, which comes out of the box with your Elasticsearch service. And then you've got your custom web app that you've created that allows them to curate and update the answers. You can even extend this custom app to allow them to update utterances and to allow them to update um, synonyms for your slot values. I wouldn't recommend you let that app create new intents Creating a new intent takes a bit of a process and thinking and working through. 
but you can definitely allow them to create all the metadata and all the utterances and everything around that. Um, I mentioned that what's unique about Lex is that it's got Lambda, it can call Lambda at two different places within an intent, which is really cool. The first time you can call a Lambda to do initialization validation. Um, Lex will not always be able to validate the, the, the data in the slot values for you. There are certain circumstances when um, you would choose to bypass Lex doing that validation and prompting you for a correct answer because you could be utilizing it to maintain uh, a value in, in session state. So when a user starts a session with your bot, you could set it five minutes, 20 minutes. We typically set it to five minutes. So if we had to introduce the notion of a campus, if we work in a university with multiple campuses and obviously there are toilets on all of the campuses, so if we extend that, where can I find a toilet? If it's the first time and it doesn't find a value in the session for a campus, it'll say which campus, and you might say Melbourne CBD, great. And I'll tell you where you can find a toilet in the Melbourne CBD. Oops, I'm quickly running out of time. Um, and I'll tell you where you can find a toilet in Melbourne CBD, but then you want to store Melbourne CBD as a session var variable. So when the user asks again, where can I find an ATM, it'll automatically assume you're talking about Melbourne CBD. So this is just an example, but you can set that context for your user session. And typically there, you can't force the user to fill in the campus slot because it could be in a session variable. So all of those things are nicely taken care of there. Then all you have to worry about in the Lambda fulfillment is just getting the answer. You can assume all the data is correct, all the data that's passed through to it from Lexis has been validated, it's been um, checked, and all you've got to do is just get the answer. Just talking about that interceptor, um, we primarily just use that so that we can get uh, analytics a lot quicker, near real time and that was a, a requirement from the customer. But then we, we had an internal hackathon and we kind of extended this a little bit. You can add Amazon Translate at this point so you can immediately make your bot multilingual. And we made our bot automatically accept, well, any language uh, because Translate will take whatever comes in and then it'll actually tell you what language it is. You can then convert that to English, send it to Lex, get a response. You know what language they initially asked it in translate it back to the language and send it back to the user interface. So you could utilize Amazon Translate to immediately have your multilingual bot. And then Amazon Comprehend uh, for sentiment analysis, just to, to gauge how this conversation is going with this person. What's the sentiment of the way that they're phrasing and asking the questions? And um, another customer we had already had a third party uh, chatting solution live chat, and uh, we wanted the bot just to be another agent in this live chat uh, solution that they had, and we utilized the interceptor approach or proxy, and we were able to expose Lex as just another agent, a bot specific bot agent, uh, to this third party application. And what was really nice about that and what you'll find as well if you need to integrate with these sorts of uh, solutions that exist you need to do a handover to a human, and you want to do a handover with a transcript of all the history that's already been discussed so that this person can just pick up, see what's already been discussed, what the user's after, and continue with the conversation. Okay, let me quickly show you a little bit of code. So it's a very, very basic DynamoDB table that we created. Um, it's got a petition key of an intent name. So if you remember, the intent was find intent. And then it's got a sort key, which is slot values. And in this instance, I only had the one slot value, which would either resolve to ATM or parking. If you had more slot values, if we had, and, and I show that, uh, talk about that in the code later, but I'll just mention it quickly. Um, if you had a campus as well as what you wanted to find, we just concatenate those values with a pipe character in the middle, whatever you want to. And there is a certain order in which you need to concatenate them, obviously, because that's the way that it's going to be stored. So I'm going to show you a little bit of code now. 
first of all, let me show you Lex. So here's Lex. Here's my bot name, Summit 2019. I've created this custom intent called Find Intent. I've given it some utterances. Where can I? Where is? Where is? I'm looking for. And then I've also created a slot type, a custom slot type. So it's got a lot of built-in slot types. Basically, all of the slot types you can get for Alexa, you can use. Ordinal numbers, cardinal numbers, cities, actors. Uh, there's a lot of ge geographical stuff there. If you talk about countries, um, dates. So you can actually just use a built-in date time one, which is great because you can say, I'm going to book a meeting for next week, Tuesday. And I'll actually resolve next week, Tuesday for you to a date value that will send through to your Lambda. So in this instance, we created a custom slot type. And um, I don't want to get too deep into Lex, but you get two slot types, expand values or restrict to slot values and synonyms. Expand values is typically uh, when I did a bit of work at Coles, um, you think you're not going to capture every single product that they have in their range as a slot value with all the different synonyms. So you just let Lex keep learning from the values that you're putting in there. So I want to order bread. Uh, bread will automatically be put into that slot value. Um, so Lex doesn't actually do any um, of a validation of that value that you put in. But it'll know, for example, through learning, to put in white bread as you know, uh, two, two words into that slot value, not white or just bread, but actually white bread. But more and more you'll find you'll be working with restricting them to slot values and synonyms. So I've created the value there, ATM and parking, and then you can go and create a whole bunch of synonyms for those. <coughs> then you use those slot values inside your utterance. So where can I find? So I've got a find type, slot type. I've created a slot from it called find slot based on that find type. And over here, you'll get all sorts of other built-in slot types, country, airports, authors, all sorts of stuff. Um, and then I would capture that in my utterance. So where can I, f where can I find parking? Where can I withdraw cash? Where can I park? That is what the bot will understand. And if the bot needed to elicit more information from you, you could actually go here and you could prompt, what are you looking for? What would you like to find? How many times would you like the user to retry? And then this is where, if you remember, what are you looking for with the buttons? And that's where I have to find that. What are you looking for? Then I had the buttons. The button title and what button value. And these button values are the slot values from that slot type, find type slot value. So when the user clicks there, it just automatically knows that that slot value will then be parking. And then it calls the Lambda over here. So it'll kick off. So once it's got all that information, and because it's a required slot type there, it's required, Lex will handle getting and eliciting that value. So Lex has got very different dialogue states and it'll go into elicit slot state and wait for the user, it'll prompt the user, what would you like to find and give the buttons and let them click. Once it's got all of that information, only then does it actually execute the Lambda code. The Lambda code will come in, um, <coughs> Further down, this is all done in Python. Further down, you've got your standard uh, event and context. Lambda will come in there. It's got a certain payload, of course, coming from Lex. You will find that on, the, on our documentation. From there, we will dispatch the event, the data that came in. And now, typically, um, I don't need that there. Typically, you would have different intents, might go to different code blocks to be handled a certain way, but because we're doing something fairly generic, we've got a generic DynamoDB structure, uh, we could actually just use, and because we're using the intent name as well as the slot values, that is not required. I've just left it in there for example, but if you had multiple intents, that you know maybe the other intent had to call an API to execute a reservation, 
another intent, maybe I had to call out to a, a, a service now solution or something like that. Um, but what it'll do, it'll go to this any intent. We'll retrieve the intent name. We'll get all of the slot values. We'll concatenate those slot values with a pipe character. So I don't know how many they are, but we'll concatenate them. And then I'll just go and remove that pipe character, the very last one, because it's, it's, it's useless. And um, if there were no slot values for the intent, you know, you might be thinking, well, what will I use for the pipe? Um, what will I use for the slot values value? And all that we do is we will just duplicate the intent name. So the intent name there, if you know it's got no slot values, because you'll know you would have defined that, you'll just put the intent name there again. So is everyone following? Is this clear? Yeah? <clears throat> so back to the Lambda code. We go concatenate an array of slot values and once we get them, we just go to the table. We do a get item on the primary key and the partition key. Uh, sorry, on the, on the partition key and the sort key. And we bring back the answer and we send it back to Lex. And Lex then obviously sends it off to the, to the user. So that was my cheeky little answer. Please ignore the machines. And this is where you want to give your support staff a, a, a web interface, you know, view, react, whatever your, your, your go-to is. Or even if you want to build it as a set in the content management solution, if you've already got something in place, you can talk through to the API. Um, and if I had to go and do there, uh, this is just a... So the nice thing is, if the answer is incorrect, you don't need to redeploy or do anything <coughs> because it just obviously pulls it out. And that's what I've just added over there. If you are going to train it with new utterances or you are going to put new synonym values or slot values, you would need to rebuild your Lex model. And you can put a CI CD pipeline in place. We, of course, do that with our customers. Um, but if you just need to update the answer, and you wouldn't necessarily go do it straight in production unless it was urgent, unless the answer was horrendously wrong and it could have caused some issues. Um, but you effectively end up with an end to end solution. And we have been using this quite successfully. Oh, sorry. At um, at least three universities, this basic architecture. So you've got all the analytics there. If you use Splunk, if Splunk is your t your, your your log of choice, Kinesis Firehose can just dump it straight into Splunk now for you as well today. Not a problem. Um, but if you don't have anything, if you've got nothing set up and you want to get started, there's a nice end-to-end -end solution for you that will, yeah, just kind of works. And it's really quick and easy to set up. And once you've created that little bit of Lambda, you can just reuse that um, continuously. Your biggest challenge, I think, out of all of this would actually building this little custom web app. Thank you very much for coming. I appreciate your time.